Uh, Cyberpunk is an interesting one. The 2020 world is a fusion of many types and elements of the overall cyberpunk genre. And it's about a combination of technology gone wrong, but being used by people in novel ways up against large mega corporations, powerful people and powerful forces, governments, etc., that are all pretty much conspiring to keep people oppressed and stomped on. Uh, it's, as um, it was once described in somewhere, it's a craptastic world. We have a lot of amazing technology, but that technology can be used by gangs, by corrupt officials, by cops, by crazed cyborgs running amok. So it's basically, if you took some of the elements of Blade Runner and amped them up to 11. Actually, they line up really well. Um, part of it is the fact that they dragged me out there quite often to sit and talk to the entire studio about how the world works, what makes it tick, what was I thinking when I did certain things. So they don't just do that with one studio. I've you know, visited all the studios at some time or another. And we sit down and we talk about it. We talk about, okay, so what did this particular thing in the world mean? What is, you know, how does Arasaka work? What's its relationship to Militech? How do people live day to day? And all those are discussion points on the table as we kind of you know, etch out where we want to go. So the resulting project looks a heck of a lot like what was in my head. Actually, it wasn't as much of a flash, and I'll tell you why, is I'd seen it two weeks earlier. And so there I was, and um, my, my son Cody works for Talsorian as well as a designer. Um, he was with me, and we watched it, and we went, jaw, you know, jaw dropped, mind blown. But we couldn't tell anybody. You know, it was that secretive. We literally snuck into town to do the E3 show. Everybody snuck into town. It was really funny because nobody likes to, at CD, blow the surprise. We want fans to see something and go, oh wow. And if they get spoilers all the time, there isn't that, hey, I just discovered this cool thing. Oh yeah, I already knew about that. Yeah, whatever. So yeah, it, um, I actually had seen it. So I was more impressed actually by how they rolled it out, the entire hijacking of the conference, which was just brilliant. I kind of knew they were talking about it. I just talked to the marketing guys. They said, yeah, you're like this. But actually what was done in there, I'd already seen the basics of it before. And I went, yeah. And that, by that time it was like, oh, okay, yeah, it's just gotten cleaner, it's gotten tighter. And for me it was exciting because I went, and I happen to know that this is game footage. This is not something yeah. pretty they build. This is the engine, you know. And I also had another advantage I'd also seen with, you know, some, some glitches and things because it was still way the heck back there. Uh, I'd also seen gameplay. I'd actually seen it run, seen it on the ground as it were. When we did Cyberpunk originally, the genre was pretty new. And so most people didn't have a clue as to what the genre was about or what you could do. And that's why we went through, and in my design, I explained what classes did so that people would have a context in which to place their gaming characters. So out of that, we got characters that were fairly obvious. Solos, for example, are essentially muscle and guns for hire. They are combat hired people who specially is delivering force at the right time in the right place for enough money. They sometimes work for corporations. They oftentimes will also work for the guy on the street. Depends on the job, depends on what is necessary. But the flip side of it, for example, is Rocker Boys. Rocker Boys, um, personal favorite, are more than just people who get up with a guitar and play. Um, I like to think one of the prototypical Rocker Boys might be Bono from U2 in that the music that U2 is writing is political, is meant to get people up and in the streets, it's meant to expose corruption, indifference, problems that are happening every day. 
so it's music with a challenge. But a rocker boy doesn't have to be a musician. A rocker boy can be anyone who's a orator of the people, anybody who can talk to others and convince them by the power of words, music, sometimes art, and so forth. Yeah, it is a bit Mad Max. I love Mad Max. But oddly enough, the biggest influence was uh, my friend Walter John Williams did a book many years ago called Hardwired. And Hardwired, one of the major characters is a Panzer boy, which is a guy who basically does deliveries across a post-Holocaust wasteland in a fan tank. And I asked myself, in a world that's gone to hell, no one's gonna have FedEx anymore. No one's going to have easy movement from place to place. So nomads are more than just Mad Max dudes with mohawks, leather, rolling down the highway. They are basically the people who get stuff moved from A to B, whether it's on the ocean, whether it's underwater, whether it's in the sky, and they have a very, very dangerous occupation because it's a world that doesn't want them to do this or wants to steal their stuff. Uh, Han Solo would have made a pretty good nomad. Interestingly enough, Netrunners, we ended up with something a bit different originally. Uh, and this is because I hadn't actually read any of William Gibson's work at the time when I first started writing this. Uh, I only had what Walter had written and ideas I had begun to put together because I worked in software. And Netrunners are effectively, I think of them as a combination of the thieves of the world and the information brokers of the world. They go in, they find stuff, but they find it within a network. And the net in cyberpunk is more than just floating icons out there and you know bright colors. It's an information structure that these guys are very good at digging around in. This is actually becoming more important since an event we did with cyberpunk many years back called the Fourth Corporate War. When the net was pretty well torn up, the net runners were the only people who could actually start finding out what happened to the financial records, what happened to the information, who really ran the world. So net runners, uh, in some ways, are almost digital Indiana Joneses as well as thieves. What happened was, uh, before I met CD Projekt Red, uh, I started Cyberpunk Red, and it was essentially going to take the timeline forward from the events of the Fourth Corporate War, which ended a period at 2027, and it was going to move things forward. I did a version of it called uh, Cyberpunk V3, which was like a what-if story. Think of it as a, a side story. But I wanted to continue the main storyline because, as you guys probably noticed, we moved the timeline forward. You know, we started with 2013, we moved forward to 2020, 2077 wrapped that timeline, then we we're gonna move forward from the 30s into the 40s and 50s, okay? As it turned out, um, we always have a dominant color scheme in projects we do, and we had done a green color scheme in uh, V3, so I said, hey, I'll do this one in red because of the black and red combo that we're known for. So it was nicknamed and coded Cyberpunk Red. And that's the name. And then something like six months later, as I'm banging away on it, you know, my business manager comes in and says, hey, there are these guys named CD Projekt that want to talk to you. CD Projekt Red. Total coincidence. What it's about pretty much is moving the timeline past the fourth corporate war. And one reason we refresh the timeline and alter things is that at a certain point the players have mined out all the possibilities of the existing part of the timeline. So they've gotten all the biggest guns, they've gotten all the APCA armor, they have all the enhancements, they've fought Saburo Arasaka to a standstill, you know, the whole bit. So what we do is we change things up. So the fourth corporate war was deliberately designed to scatter all the possibilities of the wind. Uh, technology disappeared or reappeared or moved in other ways or became more like a treasure hunt. 
Uh, we wanted to explore what happens when the fundamentals of a technological society don't get destroyed because there's just too much of it, but they get seriously messed up. So for example, we blew the net apart, but you're still gonna have cell phones and limited nets because all those routers and all those cell phone repeater towers are around somewhere. But you're not gonna have the net reaching across the entire world. So you'll have micronets. You'll have cell phones that work within a city. You'll have specialized phones that go beyond that. You'll have all the weapons you had, but there'll be new weapons that have been created or kit bashed together because there's no longer a Militech cranking out Militech handguns. So the idea was to make it more of an exploratory world, to expand things a bit beyond Night City, to tear down some of the assumptions and allow players to find a whole new way, not to play the game, but to, to explore the game. And the great part was then with 2077, there's this really nifty span of time between where we are in the 30s all the way up to 77. And you know, a lot of stuff can happen in that period. So is this, so this is almost kind of, I guess you could almost call a prequel to and that's, that's still kind of, it's kind of loosely like that right now. I don't think we've, any of us have entirely decided where that sits yet. You know, uh, obviously they have drawn tremendously upon 2020. And they're popping up with things all the time. Um, it was fun looking, for example, at the skyline in the trailer and just pointing out all the different things that were obviously part of the earlier 2020 rev. Yeah, you can see the yeah. different uh, companies and corporations just like mm -hmm. in, the, in the train. Yep, but there were a bunch of new ones. And my immediate thought is, okay, where do those guys come from and how does that work? And does it go all the way back to 2077, all the way through to 2027? You know, what's the continuity? That part we're still kind of working out. You know, like I've said, it's, it's always in process because when you have a lot of really smart people and they have something they love, they keep experimenting, they keep finding things out. Responsible.